Well, it's the price of admission right there. You could put up with me preaching just to hear Janice play that. Amen. Amen. I agree. I asked Broadus to sing that song because uh, um, a couple weeks ago I spoke on um, uh, the God of the resurrection. And in that line, I started thinking a lot about that is who our God is. You know, every other faith that is out there has a dead God has no master that's alive and well. Every other faith that is out there walks through life without ever having a promise that there's something beyond that. And that's unsettling in our soul. And especially in the day and time that we live now where there is so much unsettling in our life. And we have to have hope. There needs to be something that we can look forward to. I mean, this is our first Wednesday night back. We've been meeting on Sundays. And even then, we don't have anything. Our kids aren't running around back there. And Lance is in here with us rather than trying to wrangle them. And we were talking about uh, when school starts and, and how uh, that's, the, that's what I'm looking for is the day that, that they say that kids can go back to school because there will be no social distancing when the kids are in school. So they're going to ease up on us and we'll be able to do even more for that. But, you know, what do you do when you have no hope? What, what, what are you gonna, what's, what's going to give you peace in your heart at night when you're, you're laying there and wondering, what happens if I don't awake tomorrow? You better have a God of resurrection. You better have something that's bigger than life. You better have something that's bigger than your circumstances, big, bigger than your difficulties, bigger than your hardships. You need to have something bigger than us. If all we have is a God the size of us, we are, of all people, most miserable. We need something that's so much bigger than that. So if you have your Bible tonight, I promise not to be long tonight. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 4. We're going to go straight in the message. 2 Kings chapter number 4. If you're uh, wondering what that's about in the Old Testament, there was a, a prophet by the name of Elijah, and God sent him uh, uh, someone to mentor uh, someone that he could uh, um, disciple who would take his place after him. And uh, that is, his name was Elisha. Elisha has seen uh, his master, Elijah, not die. Now, the ones that mentored me, um, they're, they're in heaven. They're in heaven. Matter of fact, one of them the, that I loved so very, very, very much, um, who meant so much to me, who knew my grandparents that I didn't know, who was in the ministry um, from before World War II, um, I got to do his funeral. And what an amazing thing to be able to do the funeral of someone who meant so much for you. But to know that uh, every time that I've done a funeral, Brother Lance, uh, if I knew that that person was a believer in God, that to know that uh, I, I'm there speaking to those that are alive because the one who is dead is really not dead, the more alive than they've ever been, absent their body, present with the Lord. And there's great comfort in that. If you go to that place and there's, there's, no, there's no resurrection on the other side, you just got a dull ache. You just have uh, preparation, you know, Preparation for what? Preparation for nothing. So you better have something that you're looking for that's going to be able to carry you through onto the other side. And in this story, we're going to begin reading in 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse number 8. You there with me? Say amen. If you're not there, say wait. I mean, I gave you five minutes. You ought to be able to find it in five minutes, right? All right, here we go. 2 Kings chapter number 4, verse number 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunan where there was a notable woman. Now I don't believe in coincidences, do you? I believe my sovereign God knows the encounters that we're going to have in our day before we ever have them. I, I think that before I live my day, my Lord has prayed for my day. And he knows all those things that are going to be going on. So uh, Elisha's probably uh, kind of what we would 
think of in the, the last century was a circuit riding preacher. He was going around in his circuit, meeting the people, uh, doing church not in buildings. Amen? The church is not a building. When I was a real little kid, you remember, y'all remember this? Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors, and there's the people. Well, that's not today. Today we need to teach our kid, here is the church, and here is the steeple, open the doors, and the people are everywhere, right? It's very rarely that we're getting back together. I see Jim and Doris, this is the first time they've been back together with us. Good to see you back in your pew. Others have barred your pew while you have not been here, amen? But, but think about it, the church is the people, not a building. Now, though this building stands as an anchor in the community, to, to think of what goes on here. But what goes on here is in the people as we go there. Right? We may meet and have a holy huddle, but then we're going to go out and we're going to do the work of the Lord everywhere that we go. It's not one place, it's many places that we meet together. Well, this notable woman, she's there and she sees Elisha. Verse 8, it says, And she persuaded him to eat some food. Uh, I must be kin to her because if my mama was around and you were going to be around her, she was going to feed you something. Sweet tea would be involved. Amen? Oh, y'all are asleep because if there ever been an amen moment, Brother Bradley, I should have heard one out of the back. That's right. He said, so it was as often as he passed by, he would turn into there to eat some food. Now, if he is a um, if he's just a, a pastor that's going around, he sees a tree, sees some people there, and he speaks to them, goes maybe to the city gates, and there's some people gathered together, and he'll see them. And, but there's just people that are there, and what did he have? He didn't carry a, a lunch bag with him. He was looking for the graces of the people to, to provide for him. And this woman sees him and says, this is a man of God. So he said, come, she said, come eat with us. Probably a very wealthy woman, very known woman, very respected woman. So when he was drifting in, he, he would go to her house and eat at her house. Probably had banana pudding involved in there somewhere. If there was a Baptist, there was a banana pudding involved. I don't know. Verse 9, and she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God. The church listened to me. Man of God was a title. I never have liked the title reverend. But I love it when people call me preacher or pastor. But this was his title, man of God. If he had gone down to the Ikea and made up business cards, it would have said, Elisha, man of God. But he didn't have a, a business card. What he had was when people saw him, they said, man of God. Now that's a title, but notice what she puts with that title. Holy man of God. This is saying he is so different. He is not just a, a, someone who holds a position. This is a man that when I see him, I know that he is, the word holy is, is different, separated. This is a man separated unto God. So he says, look now, this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, now she's talking to her husband, please let us make a small upper room on the wall. Here's their house, and, and there was usually a flat roof, and there would be stairs on the outside that would go up to the flat roof. She says, let's just build another room. Let's build another room so that he will have a place to stay. Let us put a bed for him there, a table, a chair, and a lampstand. A bed a table, a chair to sit at, something that he can read with, a lampstand, so it will be that whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Now, look, they didn't have Holiday Inn Express. I mean, this would have been a, something more like a Hilton, amen? But just a place where when he comes, he can have a place to rest. Where did he normally rest? Maybe out under the tree. Maybe just uh, some soft grass. Now, a little different, his mentor, Elijah, um, what was his menu? Y'all remember? Kind of like John the Baptist menu. I mean, just 
roughing it. What did he wear? I mean, he looked almost like Fred Flintstone with the leather around him and the, and the belt around him. He, you would look at him and you'd say, this guy was not going for looks. We're not, we're not talking about a, a suit with a pressed shirt and a, a nice crisp tie. That's not what this is about here. This is a man of God who, would, who was a man of the earth. Now, Elisha didn't tell us, it doesn't tell us that he dressed like Elijah, but he probably had the same wardrobe, and he just would, would, would be out under the stars waiting for someone. And she said, let's, let's build a place for him where he could have a room so that when he comes by, he can have a bed to sleep in. Maybe a nice little microwave and a, a, a mini uh, refrigerator, you know, uh, uh, maybe a washer dryer where he could feel refreshed, a hot shower. No, but maybe just a bed, a table, a chair, and a lampstand. So look what it says in verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there, and he turned into the upper room and laid down there. Now, I don't know how long he had been. Probably stopped by the, the, the woman, it let her know that he was there. Probably got a little meal, maybe some bread, maybe some oil to dip it in. Maybe some spices in the oil. Maybe there was some fresh drink that was there. And he ate a little bit and he was tired and weary. And now he had a place to lay his head. And he went in and he laid down and he probably said these words. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. God bless this place. Probably just felt good. Probably just felt rested and relaxed and wonderful and he was in a good mood probably had a full stomach and he thought hey there's something i need to do so he said to his servant gehazi verse 12 call the shumanite woman and he called her and she stood before him now she probably didn't know what was going on he went down the man of god would like to speak with you so she comes to the place and he said uh now say to her now verse 13 I don't know, because she was a Shumanite, if there was a language barrier. I don't know if it was because he was trying to separate himself. And, and Elisha was one to do so. Elisha was one to do so. If he was going to do something, he didn't want to be in the limelight. He would send his servant Gehazi to, to let him be in the, the limelight. Elisha was one who would, who would take a step back, so to speak. Maybe he heard that from Elijah. Elijah, in his ministry, he stood before the king one time and wasn't seen for three and a half years. He wasn't one to look for the limelight either. But he said, call for the woman. Let her come. So she, she came and he said, say to her, look, you have been concerned for us, he's thinking of himself and Gehazi, with all this care. What can I do for you? This woman has gone out of her way to be hospitable to him. She's taking care of his needs. He feels good about it. And he wants to do something in return. So he, he's saying, what can I do for you? Then he goes on a little further. Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? Is there something I can do for you? You got to... You got a water problem? Anybody picking on you? Anything I can do? Can I speak on your behalf? And by the way, he had sway with the king. He had sway with the commanders of the armies. They looked up to Elisha. Anything I can do for you? I, in our world, one of the things that I think that are, is, is being missed or overlooked or not thought much of is just general politeness, hospitality. I mean, sometimes we may see something and may, we may see a need, and we may even go so far as to say, it would be good if that need were met, but are we going to do anything about it? Are we going to put ourselves out? Are we going to take our time to help somebody else out? I don't know, but I don't, I don't see as much of it. I don't see as much of it. You know, it's one thing if somebody calls you and says, I need you, if you get up and go. But what, what if you don't, nobody's calling you? What if you just see a need? Are you going to meet that need? 
I will tell you that I have had people in my life that have gone out of their way to bless me and Lynn. And I thank the Lord for that. And, and I've also had people in my life that didn't come to bless me. They wanted, be, they wanted me to come bless them. And, and I better live up to their expectation because if I don't do what they want, when they want, how they want, if I don't do the ministry like they want, I'm going to be fried preacher. That's just the way it is. That's just the way that it is. But isn't it good to see that here was somebody who somebody had done something nice to them, and they simply say, what can I do nice in return? But look, listen to her reply. She answered and said, I dwell among my own people. Basically, you know what she's saying? I'm good. Appreciate it. Enjoy the room. I am, of all people, so blessed. So very, very blessed. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And he's talking to Gehazi. Gehazi answered and said, look in verse 14. Actually, she has no son. Her husband is old. Now, evidently, this was a woman of means. She had money. They had property. They had fields to work. They had slaves and servants to help them in the endeavor that they would take care of those people as well. So like having many employees, so to speak. They had a lot. They had animals, things to work. He's, but she had no son. And it really didn't matter. If you did not have an heir, it would all end with them. And though others may not have had any of the means, the financial means or the educational means, if they had children, they were seen as more blessed. Now, she's not looking for anything. She's not saying, oh, man of God, if you would pray a prayer for me. No, she's just saying, I'm very, very good. God's taking care of me. Uh, I, I dwell among my own people. But Gehazi said, you know, really, she doesn't have a child, doesn't have a son. So he said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, Listen to this now, verse 15, 16. About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. Ladies, what would go through your heart? The one thing, I wonder how many times she said, if I only had a son. And he's saying, this time next year, you'll have a child. What was her answer? No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Literally, she's saying, there is no way I could imagine. Don't, don't get my hopes up. Don't, don't, don't say that God's going to take care of this, and, and I'm going to start looking and thinking and wishing and wanting and planning and, and, and preparing a room. And, and, and No. It would be better that you never said it than if you said it and it didn't come true. Verse 17, not another word said, it's left at that, listen now. Elisha is thinking, can my God do this? I'm sure he can do this. Would my God want to do this? I think we have programmed ourselves so much that we've gotten to the place that, that we're not even sure if we want to pray because we're not sure if God would come through. That's defeatism. You may say, well, preacher, this is bold. It is bold. It's an unbelievable statement of faith. But listen to me, please. What's wrong with that? To know the nature of God, to know that God's a God of love, to, go, to know that God is a God of I can. Would it not honor him to have someone stand up and say, God can and God will? Is it gonna, is it gonna make God mad to be on the throne in glory and to hear this and say, say, you know what? I could do that, but you didn't ask me about it. Faith is moving into a situation and seeing beyond the situation to see the hand of God. 
Faith is believing the impossible, impossible, the God of the impossible being made not only possible but real. Faith is seeing God in his nature and his love and his bounty and claiming that. What good are we doing to know Bible stories and not know the God of the Bible? What good are we doing to, to walk through life and, and, and walk through the deficit of life and the, the hardships of life and the difficulties of life and not have, saying that we have a God who can but, but not ever reaching out to God and by faith? Are we afraid we're going to offend God by believing in Him, by trusting in Him? Are we afraid that, that, that if we say something amazing, and, and of belief and of trust, well, I'll look stupid if God doesn't come through. The one thing Elisha wasn't worried about was looking stupid. He was wholly, se he was wholly separated out for God. Lance, he was sold out. He wasn't worried about that. Is this something God would do? Is this something God would Can he? Would he? Will he? And he believed. I want you to see this. She wasn't asking for it. But he believed on her behalf. There are some of us that are already Christians. Already believers. I've been a believer for this past spring. 48 years. I, I, I've been a believer most of my life. I, I, I hardly can think of a time when I was not an already a child of God. The first 10 years of my life. But, but listen to this. If I am a child of the King, if I am a joint heir with Christ, if, if His blessings go before me, if I know these things and believe these things, and I've seen these things, and I trust in these things, sooner or later, I've got to get beyond living just for me. Why can't I go lay hands on somebody else and believe on their behalf? They may not even believe yet, but I can believe on their behalf. Why can't my faith, Go forward on behalf of someone else. You'll never be a witness of the goodness of Christ if you don't believe in the goodness of Christ. If you don't believe somebody can get saved and give their heart and life to Christ, you'll never talk about it. But if you think about all the things that God has done for you, why can't you lay claim Hand on that and hand on somebody else and believe God to be a God of I can. Well, I spoke longer on that than what I thought I was going to, but verse 17. The woman conceived. <laughs> to me, that's as powerful as Luke 2. I understand Mary was a virgin in Luke 2. She had never been with a man. And this this woman had a man, but the Bible says, and he was old. That meant, <laughs> I don't know about her. And I don't, this may be an Abraham Sarah moment. I don't know. But I wonder what it was like. Women, do you remember what it was like when your body changed? Do you remember what it was like when you said to your, your friends, you know, I think I might be pregnant. Janice, don't look at me like that. You've been there, forgot, di didn't believe, and yes again. Amen. Lynn, don't you th look at me like that either because that ain't happening. The woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. And can I say amen, amen, and amen. She was a believing woman, but I, do you think that her faith may have gone to another level? Do you think of her encouragement may have gone to another level? Do you think every day chasing that boy around that she thought, my God can? I think that brought glory to God. I believe that brought blessing upon him to see how he would bless others. Verse 18 says, and the child grew. Like a weed, I'm sure. And it happened one day that he went out 
to his father, to the reapers, that time of the year. They're out working in the field, and he wanted to be like his dad. He went out on his own. I don't know what age, but I would say maybe at least five or six. Maybe older, I don't know. But life's been good. A boy being a boy. Probably wanted to go out and help. And as soon as he gets out there, verse 19, he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servants, carry him to his mother. The little boy's hurting. Dad says, get him to his mom, she can nurture him. Verse 20, when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon. Come on, moms, getting up on the lap, rocking him, soothing him, maybe singing to him, maybe petting him, holding him close, doing everything she knew to do. You think she said a prayer? Somewhere, there's no, there's no, this child's not going to be laid down, put down. No, no, no. She's, she's got a hold of him. She's not turning loose. But somewhere around noon, it says he died. He died. I mean, to get the news that your child had died is a bad thing. But in her arms, as she's been rocking the child and soothing the child and patting the child. And you know the anxiety was there. She's feeling it. She's hoping. She's believing. She's trusting. And yet, she's believing. She's hoping. She's trusting. And yet, he dies. Does she cry? Does she wail? Is she screaming? Is she angry? Is she mad? Is she cursing? Is she yelling at God? Is she mad at her husband? Verse 21, she went up, laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Now that's not indifference, folks. That's belief. She doesn't take him to her bed. She takes him to the bed of the man of God. She lays him there, shuts the door. There's something she's got to do. There's a Genesis seed of faith in her heart. A Genesis seed of faith that she, faith is not talking it, faith is acting on it. So she lays him down. Verse 22, she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men, one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. He doesn't understand. He doesn't know what's going on. He says, why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon, it's not a festival, not the, nor the Sabbath. She said, listen to this, words. It's well. She just laid her dead child down. But when her husband says, why are you going to the man of God? She said, what? Say it. Say it louder. In her circumstances that are dark and bleak, and it looks like she's found the dead end. She's looking beyond the dead end of her circumstance. And she's saying, it is well. That's faith. That's faith. She's looking for the God of the resurrection. She's looking for God to do something that only he can do that's beyond her hands, and she's trusting that he can come through. Her focus is not on the circumstance. Her focus is not on the death. She's looking for the life. I don't know if you caught that or not. It's so easy to sound in church. It's so easy because you've heard this story before and say, yes, 
But I, wanna, I want you to know, when your heart is broken, when you don't have anywhere else to turn, God's still there. When the world says enough, God's still there. So she saddled a donkey, verse 24, and said to her servant, drive. <laughs> and go forward. She's saying, step on it. That's what she's saying. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. Don't you slow down. Don't you woe up. Don't you do anything till I tell you. Now she's believing, but she's not dilly-dallying either. Faith doesn't dilly-dally. I don't know if there's a word there or not, but do y'all know what I mean? Faith means I believe, I trust, and I'm not going to slow down. I'm going. That means I'm not going to have a prayer meeting. I'm going to go to the source. So she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Did she know where he was? No, she didn't know that. But she knew where to find him. Mount Carmel. Come on, church. You who know the Word of God, you can back up to 1 Kings, where his mentor was there on Mount Carmel in chapter 18. And there was the holy showdown between Ahab and all the, the prophets and the priests of Baal. And he was the only one standing up for the one true God. And they built the altar there. Oh, he kidded them. Build your altar. And they prayed. And they said, the God who answers by fire. You remember? Hadn't rained in three and a half years. And they went all day and into the afternoon. And he's, he, he had to be, I, I had to be kin. He's like sarcastic. He's saying, where is your God now? Looks pretty blue up there. Maybe you need to call louder. He may be on a journey. He may be asleep. Maybe you need to wake up your God. Y'all know this story. Dead Bill. Then Elijah stepped up, rebuilt, rebuilt the altar of God, put the offering on it, poured water on that thing. Wet wood won't burn. I don't want any instantaneous combustion here. We're going to make this an impossibility. We're going to make it absolutely impossible. The only way is if God comes through. Pray to simple prayer. No 10-minute prayer. Pray to simple prayer. And the fire from heaven fell, took that offering, burned it up, licked up the water from around it, and everybody said, there's one God and it's not Baal. Amen? I wonder if Elisha, when all of Israel was called together to Mount Carmel, I wonder if he had been one in the crowd. I don't know. But I do know this. Elisha spent much time at Mount Carmel. That would be a great place to go pray. That would be a great place to go make sure that there's nothing between your heart and God's heart. That would be a great place to build an altar and, and worship before a one, the one true God. So when she went to find him, she knew where to go. She went to Mount Carmel. And it says in verse 12, So it was... When the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to the servant Gehazi, Look, the Shumanite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? When Gehazi gets there, he asks. And she says, What? It is well. You know, sometimes people start out well, but it kind of fades settles in and they lose their faith they lose their hope don't ever lose your faith in a holy god don't ever lose your faith that god is still able to do mighty miracles i don't care what the world looks like i don't care what the church looks like we have a god who can the god of the resurrection she said it is well and when she came to the man of god at the hill she called him by the feet she fell down that means to worship she's contrite in her spirit now you see what's on the inside coming out there's nothing wrong with that but there's a time with that she comes and she fails, fails down before him but the man of god said let her alone for uh, gehazi's going to, he's going to push her away but the man of god said let her alone for her soul is in deep distress and the lord has hidden it from me and has not told me there will be things that god will tell you 
You'll know it in your spirit. Stand on it. But when you don't know, seek. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord with all your heart. She said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He knew right then and there what had happened. Verse 29, he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand. Be on the way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the face of the child. You just, the staff would be the symbol of what they were leaning on, the power of God that they were leaning on. Moses had a staff, touched the river and it turned to blood, touched the Red Sea and it, it, it parted. Here's my staff. Take it and go. Lay it on the child. She said, no, no, no. <laughs> Now, as the mo- and, and the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. No substitutes. Church, look up here real quick. There are some things God's going to call us into, and we're going to lay hold by faith. We're going to lay hold of a circumstance, and we're going to lay hold of a God, and I can't let Ricky do my part. Jim, I can't let you or Gary do my part. And you, please don't let me try to do your part. There's some stuff where you're going to have to step in. The power of the church is in our God through his people. I'll do what I can, what I'm supposed to do, but you do what you're supposed to do. Well, Gehazi went on ahead, laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and he told him, saying, The child has not awakened. Elisha came into the house. Now, folks, he'd never done this before. There was the child lying dead on the bed. I guarantee you his heart's doing this too. Don't you know he's broken? He went in, shut the door behind the two of them. There's some things that we're going to have to agonize with God behind doors. Not from the pulpit. Not for all the world to see. There's some, thing, there's some battles that need to be fought on our knees in our prayer closet. Where we lay hold of the throne of grace and we lay hold of a situation and we say, God, if you don't come through, we're sunk. He shut the door behind them and he prayed to the Lord. Prayer is simply talking to God. And I believe you share your heart, but I also believe you share the promises. The promise of life that he gave to that woman. The promise of a child, not to borrow a child, but to have a child. Her faith stood in the balance. And he went up and laid on the child put his mouth on his mouth, eyes on his eyes, hands on his hands. He stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Now look, is this the the, the recipe for revival? Is this, we're not doing this in this church. I'm not going to get down, put mouth on mouth, and hand on hand, and all that kind of stuff. No, he was just getting very close and very fresh to it. It was being very real to him. The child's body begins to warm. He returned and walked back and forth and again up, went up and stretched himself out on the child. You remember when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and he said, go look for the cloud to be formed? He came back and said, nothing. Go look again while he prayed. And he came back and nothing. Go look again. Just because your prayer doesn't get answered on the first time doesn't mean to stop praying. I love verse 35. He returned and walked back and forth to the house and went in, went in and stretched himself on him again. Then the child sneezed seven times. <laughs> it may have been April when everything was blooming. I don't know. And the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shemanite woman. So he called her and when she came in to him, he said, Pick up your son. 
not a dead child. She went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. She worshipped God first. She picked up her son and went out. The God of the resurrection. The God of the resurrection. I'm going to say it one more time because I really don't want it to sink in. I really want it to sink in. The God of the resurrection. Calvary may have been dismal. The Sabbath day Passover was probably very empty. But everything changed on Resurrection Sunday. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. It makes all the difference. We have a God who cares. But we're not praying to a dead God. We're praying to an alive, active God. And the question is, how much are we going to believe that? How much are we going to trust that? How much are we going to let God be God? Let God be God. Is it because God's arm is shortened that he cannot save? No. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to put this in your mind. It may have been for you when someone very close to you passed. You may have went and saw the body in the casket. You may have cried and wailed and all that, but some, somewhere in there, because of your belief and your faith in a holy God, you knew that there was hope and life on the other side. Please now listen. And peace came in. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever lose that. That peace. You may have looked at a circumstance or a situation and you said, it's over, it's done. But yet, a still small voice, a peace comes in. Never forget that. Don't judge by how dark the night is. Judged by the light of the world that's coming in the morning. Let's pray. Father God, I love you. I spoke too long, Lord. I didn't expect to speak this long. But Lord, it is your word. And you are the God of life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by you, Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my Master, and my friend. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for hearing all the prayers, all the prayers. Thank you, Lord, that we can come and bring our burdens to you and unload our burdens before you and join with you and join with your power and the hope that comes because you are alive and well and working, not just alive all those years ago, but well today and working today, and in power today. And Lord, do we have problems? Yes, sir. Do we have bad circumstances? Yes, sir. Do I know the answers? No, sir. But I know you, and I know you are the answer. You are the way. So Jesus, be Jesus in our lives. Grow our faith. Grow our trust. And Lord, let us Believe on the behalf of ourself and our circumstances, but God, give us the grace to believe on behalf of another. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you.